So, hello everybody. Um, I would like to welcome you to another very interesting um, webinar from the West um, um, Working Group for HHT. Um, I just want to introduce you to the um, to the people who, who will who you will see here in the webinar. Next slide, please. Um, but uh, first of all, I would let you know the webinar will be recorded and be available on the Basque um, um, website afterwards. I think it will take a few days, but then you will see us there. Um, after the presentation, we have some questions and answers. Um, so if you do have some, uh, remember that and then get your choice. Um, if you experience technical problems, please use the chat box to inform someone so that you can join us again. So first of all, I want to let you know something about the Vascran in case if you are not used to us. The ERN on rare vas multi-systemic vascular diseases is a so-called Vascran. Um, it gathers 39 healthcare providers, which are full members plus six affiliated partners coming from 19 EU countries. And on the other side, we have 70 patient organizations from all across Europe. HHT, which stands for Hereditary Hemorrhagic Teleanglitasia Working Group, HHT VG. Um, is the one who worked on this webinar. Next slide. So here you see the group of people who are working in this work group. I introduce you to them. It, first of all, our chair, Dr. Sophie Dupuy-Giro, the co-chair, Professor Elisabetta Buscarini, Dr. Hans-Jürgen Marga, Professor Carlo Saba, Professor Urban Geistorf, Annette Kjeldsen and Professor Ulrich Sure. From the HHT EPA community, there are two of us here. It's the HHT European Patient Advis Advisory Group. Um, it's made up from 12 EPACs um, representing from 11 different countries. Uh, we are all working together for you and for your problems and for everything what we as patients could bring in in such a group of people um, with a patient perspective. First of all, there's Claudia Corpione. She's our APAC co-chair in the Vasca and HHT. And um, it's me, I'm the deputy co-chair. Christina Krabowski is my name. Next. Um, the Vascan webinar you see today is presented um, from Professor Dr. Annette Kjeldsen, Dr. Ruben Hermann, Professor Dr. Freya Dröge, and Professor Dr. Urban Geister. You will all see them in the webinar. Next. So, in this moment, um, I will give up the We'll speak to one of the panelists. I don't know who's starting now. So have fun with the information and don't hesitate to ask questions. So who's the one who's starting? Well, uh, I will be starting here from Denmark and I will share my screen and uh, Participants can now see your screen itself here on my screen. So I hope you can see it, all of you. Uh, we need to. So the agenda for today is that I have a very short introduction on, on uh, why an HST patient has no splits. And then afterwards, Friar Drew and Urban Geistorf will talk about self-management of your nose splits. And uh, 
Ruben Herman will talk about when a nosebleed becomes an emergency. And then I will be back with when self-management isn't enough surgery, surgery and medication. And we have questions and answers then. So first of all, why an HST patient has uh, nosebleeds? Well, the nasal mucosa is filled with blood vessels so that while we breathe through the nose, we can adjust the air temperature. And uh, this is a, a nasal endoscopy of an HHT patient. And you can see there are uh, red spots around in the inside of the nose, especially in the anterior part of the nose, and especially on the wall between the two nostrils, the nasal septums. And um, that is the blood vessels can develop kind of ballooning and they easily burst and cause bleeding. And this is why the HHC patients bleed because the red spots, they balloon and burst. And HHT mutations may cause weak blood vessels and ballooning. And any trauma may cause the ballooning to burst. So this is um, the cause of nosebleeds. So the lesions can look very different in each patient and, and they often increase in size and number with age. The ones that bleed most are the ones located just inside the nose at the nasal septum, the separation wall between the two nostrils. So you see a small curly one, very small, uh, uh, lesions which are elongated and these may not bleed so much but the spot one bleed more and it looks very different in each uh, patient. So we also ask the patients when they when does the nose bleedings begin and we ask all the Danish HST patients if they could remember the age of their first bleeding episode and um, the age of dip was around 10 years of age in most patients. So in this uh, uh, figure, each blue spot uh, corresponds an individual and the red spot in the middle here is uh, median age. So this was my short introduction in why ACC patient bleeds. And I will stop sharing and send the word on to Freya. Thank you very much. I will start with my presentation. Um, there we go. So thank you very much, Jeanette, and especially thank you for um, the EPACs and Bastian for having us here. And let me start my part of the presentation with the explanation why it is so important for patients with HHT, why it is so important for you to manage your nosebleeds. Probably most HHT patients have experienced that their current nosebleeds have an influence on their daily life. And um, studies could also show that, um, I guess many of you would, um, would agree with that, that mainly longer bleedings decrease um, patients' quality of life. So bleedings may occur um, unsuspectedly and often lead to the feeling of losing control and patients may feel helpless. And I know some patients who told me that regardless of COVID, they are afraid of traveling around, maybe in the plane, maybe on the train, as they don't know uh, what to do in a foreign country or what to do when they're on the train or on the plane uh, when they start having a, a major bleeding. That's why we want to tell you um, what you can do to help yourself, um, how you can prevent the bleedings, and if not, what you can do with them, how you can deal with them. It is important to notice um, that there is no officially approved therapy for self-treatment, but there are still some things you can do to help yourself. So basically, there are two treatments um, um, options or two, two rules you need to follow. Um, you should humidify your mucosa and with this you will prevent trauma. As you all know and as you just heard, 
um, HHT um, contains of vessel malformations, which can burst their balloon and then they can burst and therefore they start bleeding. Thus, moisturizing your mucosa helps to reduce these bleedings. There's a big variety of nasal creams, oils, sprays, and gel you can use. Some might even include medications um, just as um, chalexamic acid, estrogen, or propanolol. Um, some patients also use nasal irrigators with saline solution in order um, to remove the crusts and to moisture um, the, the nose and clean the nose. Some patients love it, some patients hate it. It's completely normal that um, patients may prefer different substances, different creams, oils, gels, in order to uh, decrease the crust formation and then reduce the bleedings. So please help yourself, try some things out, find what is best for you. In general, you should be careful with creams or oils that contain vasoconstringents. These are substances like adrenaline or xylometasolin, and they lead to a vasoconstriction. And this vasoconstriction means that the muscles around the vessel may tighten and the diameter of the vessel shrinks. So of course, in the event of a bleeding, you, at the moment you apply this, it may stop the bleeding. But on the long term, on the long run, it can damage the mucosa as it decreases also the blood flow and this, uh, in turn, could increase the, uh, the bleeding episodes. Speaking of the damages and trauma, you should avo avoid those trauma as they may lead to new uh, the formation of new telangtasia, new red spots. The simplest way or the easiest way to do so would be to stop breathing through the nose. For this, you should humidify your nose, put some cream in, put some gel in, and then use an adhesive tape or some cotton wool uh, with body lotion or some other options. They may be a bit more expensive, like uh, customized olives or a special band-aid, like you see on the photo. Um, and basically the aim is to stop breathing through the nose for as many hours as you can tolerate. You can do it either during daytime or even better maybe during nighttime, because normally, well, you sleep for, let's say eight to 10 hours. And during this, you're not getting up every few hours and put some cream in your nose, and you shouldn't do this. The easiest way to, uh, to moisture your, no your nose during the nighttime will be to put some cream in and get uh, close to the nose, and then it will stay moisturized during the whole night. If it's too hard for you to, um, to close both nostrils uh, at the same time, you can do it one after another. So just close one side, then you can breathe through the other and ju then just change it um, after a couple of hours. So, however, even if you care, you take very good care of, or you care very well for your um, nose, bleedings will probably occur. So what can you do if you do have a, um, a nosebleed? And with this, I would like to hand over to Professor Oban Geistok. He will continue. Many thanks. Dr. Frey Drüge was so kind to tell you about how to avoid bleeding. And she's also too kind to um, move the slides forward for me. And so what happens if, though you follow those rules, Dr. Drüge was telling you, if it still starts bleeding, what can you do? The first thing is stay calm so that you're still able to think what to do and they don't panic. The next thing is you don't want to swallow the blood. It's not dangerous like some persons say, but if you swell it, you might, feel starting, you might start feeling sick. By this, you might start to, 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 to vomit or something like this. And that instead of one, having only one problem, instead of only bleeding, you might have another problem additionally. To avoid this, just sit up, Lean a little bit forward so that the blood will run to the front of the nose and that you can there capture it with some vessel or maybe some like a dark plastic bag so that it, that it don't, doesn't stain your clothes. A dark plastic bag so that others don't see what is happening there because otherwise persons who are not used to seeing blood may collapse in your environment. The next thing it can do is to use the constrictive effect of a cooling 
So by putting ice packs either around your neck or using ice cubes and putting in the mouth and pressing them against the, the roof of your mouth so that by this a constriction of the vessels inside the nose reduces the bleeding. Another thing is to use direct pressure. You use your fingers and you put them as far as possible to the, to the top and to, to the back of the nose you can grasp. By this you reach a big surface of both the septum and the outer walls of the nose and compress them. By this you can often stop the bleeding. After some time, of course, you have removed and to see if it still bleeds or not, and you might do this again. Some persons also use those clam clamps that you can use for swimming to compress it for a longer time. Otherwise, it's recommendable not to use any manipulations inside the nose, like blowing your nose, removing the crust, or whatever, because this might start re bleeding. If all this doesn't help, you can pack your nose. And how to do this, I'd like to show you. I brought this, and I don't know how, can, can we now get my, my picture bigger? Is it possible so how to do that? Okay, good. So I brought this, some packings. They look like this. It's a pneumatic packing and um, of lower pressure. And um, I brought a syringe and I take the outer packet of the syringe, I open that up, up and there's, there's something like a bathtub afterwards for the packing. You connect the packing together with the syringe with a ventail and there's a pilot balloon and then you use some distilled water and you use this put it here inside this um, inside that um, bathtub for the packing like that and then oh I I know I'm fearing that my computer gets wet so I put this in here and by this the whole surface will get smooth and slick. I don't know, you may see before that it was just white. Now it gets clear, a little bit clear. Yep, I hope they can see this here. Okay. And now I can also feel it's getting slick now. And I always forget which nose is wider for me, but I try, just try. And most important is now, if, if, I, if I show this from the side, don't put it in like this. There's a brain up here, you can remember, of course, at least in most cases. And the other thing is there's the mouth beneath there and the roof of the mouth is at the same time the floor of your nose. So you can put it in like that. You just lift a little bit of the nose and put this in like that and then more and more and then finally if it's in there you can inflate it. I did this wrong because I first did so I have to put in some air. You can inflate that and then I can feel how the pressure is applied there and I can also feel here that there's pressure inside that. And if the reading stop, you just remove that and you can put this to the side. And you can run around like this. And maybe after 50 minutes or an hour or two hours, some persons even don't go to bed with that and sleep. And the next day, they put that on again and remove a little of air. And if you can feel it doesn't bleed, you can remove more air. It starts bleeding again, just add some more air. And then you're safe again. And then you might go, to, if it's still bleeding, you might use, look for professional help. However, otherwise, you just leave it in like this without the air. The pilot balloon is not empty now. And then after some time, you can remove it again, like that. So I hope that this is helpful. Another possibility are packings, which look like this. You see, they look like a plastic foam. And that's also something resorbable. You can put, you can just, you can put in the whole thing. You can see it's compressible. You can just take a small part of that rip it off, if it starts bleeding, you put it inside the nose and then you put it on the bleeding side and it might stop the bleeding. So that may be also very helpful. Um, and then I would like to continue with the slides. Maybe fire, okay, thank you. So these are the slides. If the, trans if the um, transmission of the photos of, of the film that I just, ma we just made doesn't work, so please continue again and again and again. Yeah, you see how the, the humidification of the packing and how the whole packing looks like. The next slide shows hopefully how it is introduced in the nose. Yep. Yeah, how it, again the same and again the next one. You can see again how it is nicely demonstrated. Just put it in straight. The next one. 
Yeah, he looks quite happy with that, more happy than me. The next one, please. And so the other one that I was showing here, this package, that was Nasopora. There's also another one. I think there's other one on the market, which I don't know. So that's an important thing I'd like to show. The next one, the next, so that is regarding self-packing. Now I'd like to address another topic that we've got a lot of questions on, and I think which is very important for you. That is the topic of anticoagulation and antiplatelet drugs. As you all know, those may become problematic. However, fortunately, there is no absolute contraindication. So if someone tells you, you have to take this, often it works. And you just have to try, in many cases. However, the decision may be difficult. And so you might look for an expert on this, on the coagulation. These are the so-called hemostasiologists or cardiologists, or angiologists, which are specialists for the heart or for the vessels. And what they will probably tell you are, First, aspirin is fortunately often well tolerated. The second thing is, coumarins, like the German brand name is Makoma, are often better, uh, better tolerated than the so-called new oral anticoagulants. Those so-called new oral anticoagulants are apixaban, for example. And um, however, in some situations, if you really need those drugs, or maybe even co co combination of those drugs, you might start bleeding heavily. And then it may be recommendable that you have your nose either closed temporarily or permanently. For example, if you get a stent inside the heart, you might be just needing those anticoagulants for a period of something like three months. And then you can close your nose, have it closed surgically, and after three months, you have it reopened. And by this, you can survive this time. Many thanks. I think I can hand now over again to um, Annette. No, Annette? Yeah, yes, yes, you, you, <laughs> yes, I'm, I'm ready. Or Ruben is ready, uh, but just, just had to turn on the. Um, the mi microphone. So. So, thanks. So, hello, everybody. Uh, thanks you for the previous presentation. And as you can see, I'm in Denmark right now, mm -hmm. but I'm actually from France, from Lyon. And I will talk a little bit about uh, what to do when a nosebleed uh, becomes an emergency, meaning that uh, everything you did before was not enough. And um, yeah, so the general idea about this presentation is to give you general information about blood loss, so you can have an idea what, what's uh, tolerable, uh, to talk about the two kinds of emergency you might experience with regards to happy, uh, blood uh, nosebleeds, and then a short part on what you should do but the most uh, will be, uh, I will be talking about what will be done in the hospital, because if you haven't experienced it yet, uh, there's um, ways which, in which it will be different from what you are doing at home. And it's best to know what's the reasoning behind uh, what the doctors will be doing uh, when you come for a nosebleed, especially if it's severe. So just to give you an idea, 8% uh, of your body weight is actually blood, and it's around 5 liters. And you can say, grossly, it's uh, a little bit more than half fluid and a little bit less than half uh, red blood cells. So it's actually a, a fair amount of blood um, that you have inside your body. One example I can give you of what is tolerable in case of blood loss is um, a blood donation because it's actually um, usually not a problem for a healthy person to give away half a liter of blood, so a pint, depending on where you're from, um, because you would be able to regenerate completely the fluid that you lost in 48 hours. And the red blood cells would take a little bit longer, uh, around four to eight weeks, to be completely restored. Uh, depending on the iron intake that you have. And the other extreme of donation would be transfusion. And for this, there are different thresholds 
in depending on the country so i won't be talking about this but usually what we look at is um, a history health conditions for example cardiac disease and a hemoglobin level which you all might know reflects the red blood cells and the iron that you have in in your body so the two situations i want to talk to you about are acute blood loss uh, which will lead a uh, low blood volume and the progressive blood loss, which will lead to a low count of uh, red blood cells. And they both have different, uh, different symptoms and also different ways of being treated. So we'll start with the, let's say the easiest one, which would be subacute or chronic blood loss. And this, by this, I mean that you are in a period where you have a uh, very frequent nosebleeds, more than you are used to. One example could be at the start of the winter when you turn up the heat and it gets dry and you bleed every day and more than usual and you start uh, to have a risk of uh, low levels of iron because your body is not able to regenerate the red blood cells uh, fast enough. So then you wouldn't have a massive nosebleed, but too often a frequent nosebleed. So what would be the symptoms? Generally, what you would experience is fatigue. And by fatigue, I mean unusual compared to your usual status. You'd be uh, have a shortness of breath during activities that normally wouldn't be any problem. But you can also have some symptoms that are a little bit more, uh, let's say, cerebral. So you can have troubles concentrating uh, if you're working, or you can have a lack of motivation, you can have some uh, exhaustion, which can be physical, but also mental. And this uh, should alarm you, or at least you should think about the link between the frequency of the nosebleeds and these symptoms. And what you would have to do in this case is uh, you have to see your doctor. That's the short of it. So either a general practitioner, an ENT, or if you have the opportunity and you have uh, get an appointment in your HHT reference center. But if you don't get any appointment fast enough, I think you should still uh, be seen by a doctor, then it would be the emergency room, emergency department. Uh, so what will be done? Very short, you will have a clinical exam to check uh, your, your vitals and most importantly, you will have a blood, blood sampling, and this blood sampling will try to analyze how is your hemoglobin, so how is your iron status, and does anything need to be done with regards to this. So after this blood sampling, you can be hospitalized, depending on the results. You can have oral iron or venous uh, infusion of iron, and you can also have a transfusion, and all this will depend on the severity of the loss of blood you had over the couple of weeks where you had a more frequent nosebleeds. So now to the other part, which is um, the particularly severe nosebleeds. So this is actually a situation that if you don't have experienced it, it's very important to know first what to do and secondly, what will be done because uh, you will be uh, in a fragile position because of these nosebleeds. And I think it's important that you are, have a peace of mind and you know exactly the steps that will follow and that you're not surprised, but what doctors might suggest uh, is important to do. So in case of a particularly severe nosebleed, the symptoms will be a little bit different. You might experience chest pain, a shortness of breath without any activity, you can sometimes feel your heart beating very fast in your chest and you can have a too low blood pressure so you feel faint you you start uh, losing consciousness easier if you stand up you kind of feel dizzy and these are all symptoms that should not be taken lightly and you should actually in this case call yeah, so 112 in europe or any number that uh, will make it possible for you to communicate with the emergency department because in these cases you should not be the one driving to the hospital or somebody of your family you should be taking care of 
by um, medical staff or paramedical. So once you get to the hospital, then actually you do not have anything, you don't have to do anything anymore, but it will get pretty busy around you. So some of you have already experienced this and uh, others not. So let me tell you a little bit about what's going to happen. So the priority will always be to stop the bleeding because acute anemia can be dangerous for the heart uh, and it's something that has to be addressed and we cannot let the nose bleed uh, that long. So the, the, stop the bleeding is one of the priorities. And then the other priority would be to treat the anemia, the volume of uh, fluid you lost, and also the red blood cells. So to stop the bleeding, some of the parts where I'm going to talk about in the next slide will be contrary to what we told you, uh, especially with regards to you should not uh, damage your nose, but there will be some procedure which are uh, can be damaging, but we don't have any choice and also the blood clot removal which is not always recommended at home blowing your nose but in this case it, ha it has to be done and the other part which i'll just briefly detail is the treatment of the anemia so there you will also have a blood sampling and you have an infusion of saline solution and sometimes most of the times a transfusion also depending on your um, red blood cell levels but you can also have uh, intravenous iron to if you stay at the hospital some days. So what is done to stop the bleeding? It is very important that uh, the doctors who take you in charge uh, consider um, are considered about the fact that you are not a, let's say a patient with normal nosebleeds. You have, a, uh, as we explained, um, blood vessels that are very fragile inside the nose. So the means that are used have to be adapted. But nevertheless, the main thing when you're taken care of is that the priori priority remains the same. We have to stop the bleeding. So if no other mean is uh, at the disposal of the physician who is treating you, uh, then something that might be a little bit traumatic, then this is the one that has to be used because the most dangerous part in this acute situation is your blood loss. And usually we talk about an escalation where we use the least traumatic and least risky um, maneuvers or treatments to stop the bleeding. And we go higher and higher and higher up uh, if it doesn't um, address the problem. So the least traumatic is a removal of the blood clots. Usually um, this is done because in some cases it helps uh, stop the bleeding, but in most cases it's usually to make the packing more effective. And this is done through irrigation of the nose with a saline solution. So these can be sometimes a lot of volume, which is pushed through your nose to evacuate all the blood clots. And in these cases also, sometimes we can ask you to blow your nose, which is something that in other non-emergency cases, we would say is not recommended, but this is a, a different situation. The first thing that will be tried is anterior nasal packing. So all ENTs uh, are agree that we sh it should be started with the least traumatic possible. And usually we try to use something that is removable, but then again, it depends on the situation. So you have to trust the doctor who is taking charge of you uh, to, to do the right thing. So we can use either um, some absorbable hemostats that will be mixed or not with Vaseline and put in with the tool you can see here on the screen in your nose. Sometimes we put it in both sides, even if there's only one side bleeding because it helps the compression of the nose. In other cases, we can use non-resorbable uh, mixed with also some kind of lubrification. We can also use semi-rigid um, packing like the one you saw um, Professor Urban demonstrate and all kinds of different um, types of uh, anterior nasal packing that can be used. Once again, the priority is in this case, uh, the reduction of the bleeding and not always the, the least traumatic, let's say. So in some cases, uh, this doesn't work. 
And then uh, we can have to go again, uh, step up the ladder. And what is used then is uh, anterior posterior packing. So for this, I would say it's the only um, thing where I would suggest that if it's the first thing that you see the doctor uh, using when you go to the hospital for bleeding, uh, talk to him about it and ask if something else can be tried because these are very helpful and very effective, but they are traumatic. So usually, even though we use them from time to time in HHC patient, we try never using them as the first means to stop the bleeding. So this would be one time where I would suggest talk to the doctor if there's another possibility. But if there's not, as I said, the priority will remain that the bleeding is stopped. So these um, anterior posterior packing are usually inflated uh, sometimes with air, but also sometimes with uh, water. They are more painful than the small one, but also more effective. And they compress the blood vessels on a bigger area. So that's actually what makes them more effective. And in worst case scenario, you can have sometimes two of these, one in each nostril, in which case we usually try to avoid compression of the septum. So the, the, the wall that separates it's your nostril and we deflate and reinflate them regularly so this is something that can can also be done and the next step of the letter and actually the last would be an intervention and there's different kind of intervention that can be proposed to give you a general idea about how this is decided you have um, different arteries that play a role in the blood flow of your nose and even though these are not, um, this is, so this is the same for all uh, H, uh, so all patients, regardless or not if they have HHC. And there's one, let's say one major artery, um, the scientific name is phenopalatine. And there's uh, secondary arteries. Uh, so we don't call them this, but just to make it easier. And they're called uh, etmoidal arteries. And they are situated in different parts of your nose and have to be addressed differently. And usually in an emergency bleeding, when we are not quite sure where the blood comes from and we did an anterior nasal packing and it's still not enough, the first artery we would address would be the major one. And there are two ways this can be done. So once again, this is when you're in the hospital, you see that you're still bleeding after anterior posterior temp uh, packing. And then the doctors will talk usually to you about two solutions regarding the major artery. The first one, uh, I mean, it's not, not specifically the first, but one could be uh, embolization. So what does embolization mean? You can see here in black, this is your brain, this is your nose, this is basically your head, and you have a lot, a lot, a lot of blood vessels inside your head. This is the internal carotid artery, which goes up to your brain. And here in red, you would have uh, the let's say uh, the major artery which irrigates your nose. This can be uh, detected through a radiology and they, you can put a catheter inside specifically this vessel, as you can see here. And then um, the radiologist or interventional radiologist sends some, uh, basically something to block the blood flow inside the, this um, artery. There can be coils or many different things. And if you do the next the exam the next time, then you see that this uh, blood vessel is uh, after embolization completely closed off. So this is one way to address this. The other way uh, would be uh, through surgery. So if this is a surgery that's, this, that is done through the natural ways, so through the nose, there's no incision that you can see on the skin. And we try to find this blood vessel located at the posterior part of the nose with a camera under general anesthesia, so you don't, you're not conscious when this is done. And both of these options to treat the major artery are valid. There's no better one, and this is always dependent on the uh, clinic you will be treated in and the habits of the centers and uh, if there's a experienced ENT surgeon he can do the surgery if there's an experienced uh, interventional radiologist he can be the other treatment both have risks and so yeah they're both to be considered and if this is not enough or if there's a specific region where it bleeds 
There's a second surgery that can be also surprising because it's not through the nose, it's actually through the skin close to the eye. And you, we look for blood vessels that goes through the orbit inside the nose, which is in this case, the secondary artery or ethmoidal artery. And this can lead you to have an incision here on the nose. So you, the doctor will talk to you about uh, this thing and just you're not surprised or you, you heard about this. So that's, this is what will be done in case of extreme nosebleeds that you cannot manage. And I just wanted to show this last slide, the two doctors who I work with in the HHT center in Lyon, which are, as you heard, uh, Sophie Dupigiraud and uh, Alexandre Guillet. Um, back to Annette. Okay, thank you. Um, first, I, I'm going to thank especially Urban for actually demonstrating on himself uh, how to put a uh, tamponade into the nose, but also the nice pictures from uh, Freya and, um, and uh, Ruben. Uh, I was happy to see and see your presentations, but um, this last pe presentation is when is about when self-management isn't enough and uh, talk about a surgery and medication. So I will um, take you through the guidelines, the treatment with tranexamic acid, ablation therapy, and uh, celestic slides are also called nasal splints, how that can be done, tamoxifene and anti-estrogenic therapy, and then two surgical procedures, septodermatoplastic procedure and Young's procedure. And at last, the anti-angiogenic um, therapy. So we uh, discussed in the Cure HHT, arranged actually a guideline meeting in 2019 and in the next year, uh, or no, it wasn't, yeah, it wasn't 2019. And the year before we had uh, discussed in groups, uh, the guidelines for treatment of HET in general. And um, specifically, we had discussed uh, how to address the nosebleeds. And um, first of all, if you have no space, you need to be able to self-manage, uh, just as Friar Drew told you. And uh, that's compression and use of small cotton or Vaseline tamponade, and in some cases, larger tamponades. But if there's still recurrent nosebleeds, then you go on to the next, next treatment. And these are also mentioned in the guideline, and this is nasal saline rinse and tranexamic acid use of that. And you should, in this case, also check your hemoglobin and your iron level. The next level of uh, treatment would be if you still have recurrent nosebleeds, you could use ablation therapy. And I will take you further through this, but the, the, this um, implies different therapies, and that is a laser therapy, radiofrequency ablation, electrosurgery, and uh, sclerothy therapy. Not all of them at once in most cases. Each uh, surgeon chooses one of these and become very good at it. And it's difficult to be very good at every kind of treatment. So, so that, this is the third treatment step, you could say, first self-management, then second nasal rinse and tranexamic acid, and then ablation therapy. If you still have no recurrent nosebleeds, if the ablation therapy doesn't uh, help you enough, you can use other treatment modalities and the two I'm going to mention more specifically uh, are not mentioned in the clinical guidelines and that is elastic nasal splints and anti estrogenic therapy. And then at the last treatment step, we, we put in, in at the same step, so it depends on each patient, which of them you want to use. Uh, but you can use all of them and you can use them uh, stepwise. But it is uh, the use of angiogenase inhibitors, for example, bevacizumab or telidomide. It, it is a, a surgical procedure, septodermatoplastic, and it is a Young's procedure. So these are the, kind of the last uh, uh, treatment steps. 
So why do we need so many treatment steps and so many different treatments? And that is, as I said in the beginning, partly because the lesions may look very differently and therefore they also respond different to treatment. So we can have, like in this case, uh, confluent curly vessels, and we have can see more large lake-like vessels in the nasal mucosa. So first, tranexamic acid. It's a pill you, you can take early, and uh, it helps prevent fibrinolysis. And this uh, should be understood like that we have a balance and in the, if you have a cut, you have a balance towards a blood clot, but it should not be a too big blood clot. And on the other hand, you in your blood system has a, a balance the other way to give you more fluent blood. And if you take tranexamic acid, you tip a little big bit against the bigger blood clot because you need that being an HHT patient, having a cut or a, a wound in your blood vessel. You want the blood clot to stay put uh, and not to be resolved. So this is how, how uh, tranexamic acid works. And we have had uh, two randomized control studies that have confirmed that tranexamic acid, one gram, three to four times a day, does reduce bleeding in HST patients. Uh, it decreases the epistaxis severity, and this without causing uh, serious adverse events, and only actually few adverse events in general. So this is what your doctor would recommend when you come uh, first time uh, and can't help yourself manage your nosebleeds enough by yourself. Then there's the ablative therapy. And uh, in my clinic, we use a laser treatment. So my tool, my major tool is diode laser. And I do it often in local anesthesia. And this depends on the clinic you attend to, if it is going to be in local anesthesia or if it's going to be in general anesthesia. Uh, I prefer local anesthesia will, will infiltration anesthesia because uh, I, I, it's, it's correct that the giving the anesthesia will hurt a little bit, but then I can do the laser treatment without any pain and the patient can walk back home just afterwards. So this is a picture of me holding a laser fiber and I use a red or a green spot uh, to aim against the uh, telangiectatic lesions. And I'm going to show you a film. So this patient, this is an outpatient clinic and the, this patient has a um, telangiectatic lesion. And we, I have put um, local anesthesia and uh, I use the laser, try to go from the periphery of the lace, uh, the telangiectasy and into the center. And there's often a little bit of bleeding and it uh, often stops, but I put the cotton in when it bleeds and take cotton out again and go between the left and the right, right nostril to, um, to treat as many uh, telangiectatic lesions as uh, needed. And I try to treat those that seem to bleed the most. And that is those that often balloon most or those that have most crust formation. But it can be difficult if there are hundreds of lesions to know which one are the ones who are the bad guys and that are mostly in need of treatment. So, so this is my major tool uh, for ablation therapy. But, um, and, and we did a study on this. Uh, we did a study on 30 HHT patients in Denmark with mild to motor, motor epistaxis. Uh, and uh, we could see that uh, we reduced the uh, epistaxis for at least six months. And we could also see in that study that the HHT patient had a, uh, significantly lower quality of life 
compared to the Danish background uh, uh, background population, and that their uh, quality of life increased after the laser treatment. So, but there are other ablative treatments. There are other options. One of them is electrocautery. Uh, I think this should be used with caution because if you burn, if you use electrocautery, you burn uh, more deeply compared to the laser. And, uh, and there is a risk of septal, nasal septum perforation like this. This is, what is the wall between the two nostrils. And there's actually a hole here uh, due to too heavy uh, electrocautery. But in some cases, if uh, the bleeding won't stop in any other way, uh, you might need to use electrocautery. But as a preventive treatment, you should be very careful to use it uh, gently, especially on the uh, nasal uh, mid, uh, mid wall. If you use it in the outer walls of the nasal cavity, the, the risk of perforation is uh, uh, much less. I've never seen a, a perforation of the lateral, lateral wall of the nose uh, in an um, HST patient due to electrocautery. So this is an option, not the one I would recommend, but uh, then again, uh, laser treatment is my choice of tool. There's other ablative treatments, there's scleral therapy, and the, this is used with success in some centers, and it implies injection of sclerotic material in the telangiectatic lesion. So you have to take a needle and uh, get it inside the ballooning blood vessel. And when you have it inside there, you, you, you cannot move it too much because then the lesion would just start bleeding. And then you would inject the sclerotic material. And some centers have very good results using this kind of treatment. There is, as in any uh, case of treatment, there will be a risk. And in the case of sclerotic therapy, you have to be used to use it because on uh, it, uh, otherwise, you could risk that the sclerotic material could go deeper into the blood vessels. And if you are unlucky, and uh, the, then you could um, get blindness as a result. So, but, but some centers are very good at using it. And uh, uh, I, I can only say that it is not my choice of tool, but in some centers, it is their primary choice. And they, are very, very good at it. So also radiofrequency ablation is an option of ablative therapy. And there you, you have kind of a wand you hold into the nasal uh, cavity and you hold it like 90 degree close to the uh, nasal mucosa, but you don't touch it. And the, um, it, it is actually, it's not a laser, but it's, uh, kind of coagulation of the superficial part of the, the um, um, blood vessels, and it doesn't uh, uh, burn so deep as electrocautery. So if your ENT surgeon has this kind of tool and are very experienced using it, then I think that would be a, a fine treatment. So uh, I will tell you about the use of uh, silastic slides or nasal splints. These are not mentioned in the um, guidelines and this is because there have been no randomized controlled studies showing that this works. So this is more like, this is my experience. So I have these patients, uh, they uh, don't respond uh, well enough on laser treatment. And they have, uh, especially on their na nasal wall, a lot of telangiectatic lesions. And uh, if you put a plaster on a wound, you won't crash it every time you, you go around. So it, that's the idea by uh, behind using nasal splints, that if you kind of protect the nasal mucosa with a thin plate, you may not uh, bleed. 
So I've uh, chosen to use it in some patients and uh, I take these uh, thin celastic slides, I customize them for the specific patient and put them in each side of the middle nasal wall and suture them. So this would be an example if this patient would not um, respond uh, well enough to laser treatment, uh, he or she could be a candidate for uh, nasal splints having uh, telangiectatic lesions on the uh, nasal uh, wall, mid middle wall. So, and also this patient who has uh, several uh, big and small um, uh, telangiectatic lesions. And in this case, it would actually be very, very difficult to uh, do a nice laser treatment because there are so many uh, blood vessels. So there I would try laser and if it did, I didn't succeed, then I would recommend uh, putting in celestic slides. And I, this is an example of a patient who have uh, received this treatment. So you actually, it's difficult to see, but there is actually a celestic slide here and there you can see two sutures and there's a third one. And on the other side of the middle nasal wall, there's another celestic slide and there are the nuts. So the patient can breathe through the nose and um, the, the slide uh, protects against bleeding. So I will continue with the uh, Young's procedure, which is also uh, nasal closure. So the idea is that if you close the nose, you stop breathing through the nose and as breathing actually can uh, um, rip the uh, mucosa and make the, the nasal telangiectasis to bleed, then if you could, um, stop breathing through the nose, you could uh, stop uh, uh, bleeding. So you do an incision like this in the nasal uh, vestibulum and you kind of lift the skin from the inside of the nose in three places and then you suture the skin. So you have a very thin, like two millimeter thick uh, closure on the, uh, uh, anterior part of the nose. And then the back part of the nose, there is a normal room, but, but you can't breathe. So we have done that procedure in 16 patients. And as the majority of these patients are old patients, then when we uh, um, uh, two years ago contacted patients to hear what have uh, been the result of our procedure, then six of the patients were dead due to age, but the 10 patients we got hold of and they all had anemia and severe bleeding before the Young's procedure. And they all um, had normal hemoglobin and um, uh, only some of them, a few of them had bleeding uh, after the procedure. Uh, nine of the 10 were very satisfied and one wanted the procedure to be reverted. But there were, as you can understand, uh, patients who, despite of fully closure of the nose, still had bleeding. And of course, if you have closed the nose in the front part, you will not be able to put in a tamponade and it is difficult for the patient and for the doctor to, to stop the bleeding. It, it, uh, in most cases, is stopped by, your, by itself and if you uh, compress the nose. But, but this is uh, something you have to consider and have to discuss if you want this procedure done or not. Um, and of course, there is the problem or the the result of the procedure is also that you have to be a mouth breather and you will uh, have a loss of uh, smell function and to some extent uh, to some to some extent also loss of taste 
But in majority of patients, they say they have increased quality of life. It's not the first choice. There are several choices before Young's procedure. And if you are um, considering Young's procedure, the recommendation would be that you had a temporary one done for like one week where you go around with a fully closed nose uh, using plaster and a short and uh, tamponade. And then if you find that this helps you a lot, you, you can have a permanent procedure performed. Septodermatoplastic procedure is a, uh, another kind of um, uh, surgery. It is as Jung's procedure is a surgery in general anesthesia, where you uh, take um, the, the mucosal lining inside the nose, you remove it, and it's in the anterior part uh, uh, you focus on, but you can remove in different parts of the nose also. And uh, then you put in skin from the thigh, Inside, uh, instead of the mucosa, you get a um, skin lining of the nose. And this prevents severe bleeding, especially from the nasal septum, which is a nasal uh, wall. Uh, and uh, this helps a lot of patients, but the bleeding episodes from the nose will still occur, but they are reduced. And crust formation is often troublesome in these patients. So there are uh, other medical uh, choices and the tamoxifene, anti-estrogen and estrogen therapy. These are not mentioned in the guidelines, but I will mention them here. Female HHT patients have reported that their nosebleeds change with the menstrual cycle and in connection with pregnancy. And uh, they also have reported that they, it may increase uh, at the time of menopause. So female hormones like estrogen has been uh, connected with severity of bleeding. And uh, there have been studies both giving estrogen and also anti-estrogen as tamoxifen. And it had, these studies have shown that they, these uh, medications have the ability to stabilize the mucosa. Some centers use tamoxifen and it reduces nosebleeds in some patients and other centers may use estrogen, which may uh, reduce uh, the nosebleeds in, in their patients. Uh, the, the Problem is uh, somehow that there are side effects taking anti-estrogenic therapy and also estrogenic therapy. And there are side effects both uh, among female patients, but uh, definitely also among male patients. In the guideline, the uh, treatment step of uh, the very severe nosebleeds uh, where you are going to use medication, the, that is anti-angiogenic therapy and uh, thalidomide is one anti-angiogenic drug which will use, reduce the blood vessels and reduce bleeding severity. And it also reduces transfusion need in randomized controlled studies. The problem with this drug is that we all have heard of the thalidomide catastrophe uh, when the thalidomide uh, medication was introduced in the 60s as a um, medication given to uh, pregnant women in order to uh, reduce nausea. So we know that this medication can give uh, birth defects with reduced growth of arms and legs. So it's not well suited for uh, women uh, who are going to, uh, to be pregnant. And there are adverse events like drowsiness, neurological dysfunction uh, using this, but there are also patients who actually uh, stop uh, bleeding or at least have very reduced bleeding uh, using telentamide. 
another angiogenic drug is bevacizumab, and uh, we use that at Odense University Hospital as our medical tool for severe bleeding. So we have looked into does severe bleeding in HHT patients respond to intravenous uh, bevacizumab? And we found that the bevacizumab uh, in a dose of five milligram per kilo with three weeks interval for induction therapy uh, actually reduced the bleeding and increased the hemoglobin in the majority of patients, but not in all patients, but in the majority of our 12 patients, we, we saw a fine effect of using bevacizumab. We also went through all the studies that at that time point had been uh, published and the, it was the same conclusion that um, there seems to be a very good um, effect of using bevacizumab when you have either uh, epistaxis or GI bleeding. So it seems very promising. It may have side effects and you need to have intravenous administration at a hospital in an outpatient clinic to get the medication. It's not effective in all patients and the efficacy may decline over time. So this was this is my last slide. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't have a um, kind of therapy that will, will cure all HHT patients for their nosebleeds. And, uh, but, but I think we, all of the four of us today can agree that, that we uh, have options and the patients have options for better quality of life uh, if they get treatment. So thank you for your participation. And I think we will continue with the um, questions. So I stop sharing. So, thank you. It was a wonderful presentation. I think, uh, Christina, um, you're going to read the questions um, in the question box now. Yeah. Thanks. There are several questions. I start from, from the first one and go through. Um, there was a question for the brand name of the nasal tampon, uh, tampon. I think I can answer this. It was rapid renal, was, uh, what was uh, mentioned, but yeah. I hope I can show that. Yes, exactly. So that's it, exactly. And the um, Smith and Nephew is the company in Rapid Rhino. And there's different length. This one was a 4.5. I didn't want the longer, longer ones. However, sometimes you might use, use the longer ones. It's necessary. Okay. So this is maybe the answer for the um, next one. Is a nasal balloon available in the US without Eric's? Um, I think this is something we don't know here. Um, At least I didn't hear about that. At least I didn't, and I think it probably is also problematic. Even in in, uh, in Europe, I think there's no one without um, so a, a balloon without that is not necessary to, to to prescribe. It doesn't exist. I think so. You have to select the patient. You have to inform the patient how to use it to teach it and then you can prescribe because there's always a risk of um, aspirating the balloon so that it get, gets back somewhere or that there's maluse. And so I think the moment there's none of that, that is um, over the counter. Mm -hmm. The next question is, what is the first level of um, an alert concerning the iron in, your, in our blood as a patient? When, I, when do I have to be careful? So okay. uh, the um, this is really dependent on on so I, maybe I can ask the the second answer so the fact, second one first which is how often should you test your blood this is really dependent on how your nosebleed is going because if you're completely stable with regards to nosebleed and you do a regular checkup in your HHC center uh, that shows that there's no a movement whatsoever then there's actually not a huge need to check it uh, um, if you don't have uh, other symptoms so if you stop bleeding from the nose then there won't be any specific problem but usually yeah it's it's too 
dependent, let's say, on the frequency of the nose beats to give a, an answer that would suit everybody. And uh, the level of alert concerning iron in your blood, this is also something where I cannot give you an answer regarding uh, specific numbers because this would de uh, be dependent on the uh, center and the country you're in, uh, where you have, we have different um, uh, values. But uh, usually, this is not something that you would have to decide on your own as a patient. This is something that should be addressed by the doctor who follows you up. And uh, it's really not a big deal if you have, um, after this presentation, if you, if you have a doubt regarding this, I mean, you can always uh, test your blood. Uh, I wouldn't do it every week, but uh, if, you have, if you think that you have experienced more nosebleeds, then I think, don't think you should hesitate because it's, it's, now it's pretty easy, I would say, just to have an answer regarding this. Thanks. Another question is, can or should people um, who have minor nosebleeds uh, donate blood? So there's no, uh, rec so you, you won't have any contraindication because there's no problem with your blood. Um, I would say that if you have had all your life only minor nosebleeds and you have a completely normal uh, hemoglobin level and have never been under, then why not? But I, I would not recommend you donating blood uh, if it's, I mean, uh, on a regular basis, because you never know if you're going to have more severe nosebleeds. But in some cases of HHT, as uh, Annette showed, the nosebleeds start very late. So if you have an HHT patient and who has basically the same frequency of nosebleeds than the general population, then there's no contraindication of giving blood. Mm -hmm. A young man um, from 31, he's asking, uh, he already was embolized um, when he was 28. How often can he do this? How many times um, to do this again? Embolization in nose. So the problem with the uh, with the blood vessels in HHT is that you will only always get new ones. Let's say, so if you do an embolization, you could theoretically uh, get embolized all the time, but it will be less and less and less effective. And you cannot all, um, embolize all the blood vessels. So this is a difficult discussion where sometimes it's best to keep this option for uh, when you don't have any other option or you're not able to manage the treatment. And I, I, we don't usually recommend it as a treatment to decrease the severity of um, nosebleeds because there are adverse effects. But if you are if you were embolized at 28, and you are now 31 and you start to have a, a massive nosebleed, which lets, leads you to the hospital, then it, there's no problem checking if it's possible to embolize uh, or you could also have surgery, but there's no, um, it will get less effective over time and there's no recommendation that you should be embolized uh, to decrease severity if you're not um, in an emergency situation. Mm. And there was a question for the nasal streams, if they are permanent. Yeah. Uh, no, they are not permanent. Uh, they are sutured uh, to the nasal uh, wall, and uh, you can cut the sutures and then just take them out in the outpatient clinic. That's no problem. Uh, what I normally do is uh, sometimes my laser treatment fails as uh, uh, telangiectatic lesions kind of burst and bleed uh, every time I try to laser. So if I uh, treat the patient with a nasal splint for like two, three months, the mucosa and the blood vessels strengthen. And then when I take them off, it's much easier to be able to do the laser treatment. And so that's what I do in some cases. And in other cases, when the patients come back after three months, they say, oh, my life has fully changed. I don't want you to remove the nasal splint, so I let them in and just see the patients uh, for every three months. And uh, at, uh, after one year, I change them. Uh, or maybe they have that removed and see how everything goes. Okay. Then there's um, just a note. It's a thank you to you all because of the excellent and clear um, presentation. and especially for um, the cauterization and the, um, yeah, the risk it could have. So this was clear for 
some people know. Um, then there's another question for doxycycline. What, how, how do you feel about this? Actually, I think there's another question on doxycycline, uh, yeah. the last ah, one. I, hmm. Ah, okay. So we wait to this. Um, yeah. And how can septum perforation um, in the cartilage be treated? Yeah, I, I, I don't know, if Urban, do you have a, or Freya, do you have a comment on doxycycline? I, I say first what my opinion is, and then you and Ruben can also. Uh, doxycycline is a, an antibiotic. And I, I don't know uh, if this is for oral treatment or if it's for uh, nasal treatment, the question. But um, um the antibiotics may, may help because they reduce the crusts if there are a lot of bacteria in the, in the nose when you bleed. So it's kind of part of the nasal rinse. But uh, if you take daily antibiotics, you, on the other hand, will uh, have the risk of having uh, resistant bacteria. So uh, I'm not so fond of having patients on uh, doxycycline uh, every day for the rest of their lives, but the, I don't know. You Do you other have any? No, I, I don't have any um, experience with doxycycline, so I don't. I don't know, Freya or Urban, do you have an opinion? So doxycycline is um, an antibiotic, as you said, and at the same time, it's a meta matrix metalloproteinase inhibitor. And it's also used in other vascular anomalies. And there, sometimes it can be, it can be very helpful, for example, to um, stop the progression of arteriovenous malformations. However, I know only a few patients which take it in HLT. And some of them say it's helpful, and others say they think it's a placebo more. And they say, they say first that the idea that it's getting better for some time and then the, after some time it starts again and they said maybe it was just a pass, pass, um, uh, an effect that was just um, like uh, that it would have become better anyways and then become worse anyways so I don't know about that there's no at least as far as I know there's no real um, study with with, a, with good evidence yeah, I would also say the same that um, I would hesitate to give a, um, a antibiotic in a patient for permanent use um, due to maybe resistant bacteria. Um, and as Urban said, I don't know any um, randomized study that shows an effect. So um, I would hesitate to use it. But if the patient is feeling fine from Brazil with it, then it might be the right choice for him. Yeah, so there's the last question left um, with the septum perforation, um, how it could be treated. Yeah, <laughs> it's, um, it's very troublesome to close a uh, septal perforation in patients without HHT. It's not always we succeed. And in patients with HHT, they bleed more, so it's more troublesome. And you have to suture the mucosa. And when you suture the nasal mucosa in patients without HHT, you some, sometimes feel that you try to suture in butter. And when the butter bleeds, and it, as an HHT patient, it's just getting more difficult. But uh, you, you could try to close the um, uh, perforation and in, in some cases you would succeed, but you could also try to put in a um, uh, button, you say a celastic button, so you put in a uh, celastic uh, nasal splint, which uses the hole in the septal perforation for anchoring the nasal splints. So that depends on the patient, and if it's a small hole like in the picture I showed, then the nasal button would often be uh, a good choice. And uh, if it's a very large hole, uh, it, it really is exceptionally difficult because you can't close it uh, surgically and you can't use uh, any, um, any uh, celastic slides or nasal splints. So, so you, your, your treatment options are um, 
not too good. I don't know if uh, you, you are, Sorry, have you any opinion on this, Freya? I, uh, I often, when I do it in um, HHT patients, I do it in a so-called open technique to get more overview because it can bleed a bit more than, um, it not always bleeds more, but it can bleed more than in non-HHT patients if I do this surgery in non-HHT patients. Um, and yeah, as that said, the alternative to it would be a septal button. The downside or the net, uh, um, of the septal button might be that it, it will fit into the hole and if it just moves just slightly for a few millimeters, um, it, it can scratch on the um, skin of the of the hole and therefore can um, can lead to the formation of new telangiectasias, and these can start bleeding again. So this might be a bit of downside from the, for the, um, um, the, the, the button um, option. But then again, there might be, the hole might be too big. So the surgery um, might fail. Um, so it is an option or both is an option. Yeah, and also I, I saw quite a lot of holes, I think, as Faria said, some of them are just too big. The usual technique that you're using, I think, I don't know if you can see that, if you have such a hole, you make such bridge flaps, you call them by cutting above and below and then suturing it together in the middle, you do this on both sides and you put some cartilage inside. And sometimes it's just too big. And if it's too big, you can of course use such a button. If it's really too big, it often starts bleeding from the borders of this hole. And then you can just, just take out the posterior part, the, the back part of the whole septum. It's something that has been described by Doug Ross, who also is a, was an expert in the um, septodermoplasty. So it just doesn't bleed anymore from the posterior part of those, of those perforation. There's also more, um, there's also techniques that can be used for the very big buns, but they are very invasive and so that's something that has, has to be discussed, discussed very um, thoroughly if it's really worthwhile or not to do that. Sometimes if there's like that, a button may be good to try or maybe even close the nose otherwise. Yeah, there's a question concerning uh, cyclocarpone pills or tranexamic acid. And uh, uh, the bender ask how often you can uh, take the, these pills and you can take uh, two tablets of 500 milligram, that is one gram. You can take up to four times a day. You shouldn't take more uh, at one day uh, in a normal day uh, anyway. And um, you can take less if you are in a... Um, part of your life where it's very disturbing that you bleed this evening. The, the, the cyclocapone pill will help you around one hour, 30 minutes to one hour after you have taken them. So you don't have to be on therapy every single day to have a, uh, an effect this evening, for example. That's good to know. <laughs> yeah. I think that's always a question. Um, if now no other ones arrive, I would say thank you all very much. Thank you to all the um, visitors and all the active questions we got. There was a lot of new stuff in it. And so um, I would say it was a good webinar and we see it in a few days on the Bathroom webinar, uh, website, sorry. <laughs> So thank you very much to you all.